Florida, 1928. Bulldozers cleared the way for a new highway, US 41, the Tamiami Trail. The road opens an area of Florida that has been virtually inaccessible to most of the state's population for years. The forbidding swamps of the Everglades. In and around these marshes and bogs live remnants of a Native American people who once held at bay the combined might of the United States Army, Navy, and Marines. Thousands of lives and tens of millions of dollars were lost attempting to eradicate them. The whole intent was to wipe out the Indians totally from the southeast or remove them. If they wouldn't go, they were gonna kill them. But the people of this land, the Seminoles, stood and fought. They waged a hit-and-run guerrilla war unlike anything America had ever before experienced. For the United States, fighting on alien terrain against a determined elusive foe was a grim foreshadowing of another jungle quagmire. One that would baffle U.S. forces in Southeast Asia more than a century later. If you corner an alligator or a rattlesnake, they tend to turn around and bite you or fight back for survival. Seminole Indians were the same way. Juan Ponce de Leon, a Spaniard who had once sailed with Columbus, sets foot on a mysterious land he names after the Easter Feast of Flowers, Pascua Florida, Florida. Legend says Ponce de Leon was searching this land for the fabled Fountain of Youth. But in reality, he is just one of many Spanish explorers and colonizers who sailed to Florida for power and plunder. Hernando de Soto, Panfilo de Narvaez, Cabeza de Vaca, the conquistadors marched through Florida, determined to dominate the so-called New World of North America. They were for glory, God, and gold. There was nothing else in the equation, nothing else. And that was what the native people experienced. When the Spaniards arrive in the 16th century, there are more than half a million Native Americans living in Florida. Such people as the Appalachians, the Timuquins, and the Calusas. They fiercely resist the Spaniards, but are no match for their firepower, their relentless slave raiding, and the devastating diseases they bring from across the sea. In fewer than 200 years, hundreds of thousands of Florida natives are dead. 
1795. On the borders of Spanish Florida, other native peoples are flourishing. The Muscogee-speaking tribes, dubbed the Creek Indians by the British, inhabit at least 60 villages in Alabama and Georgia. But pressures from U.S. settlers have many of them looking for a new home. They join with the few surviving Florida Indians and other tribes who have migrated south to Spanish Florida. All become known as Seminoles, a word meaning renegades. So they're trying to create some coalition and trying to get along with one another. And, um, and the government then said, you're all Seminoles. And, and of course, some of the people didn't understand what they meant by that. Uh, all of a sudden, you're, you're this group of people that never existed before. William Bartram, a naturalist traveling throughout Spanish Florida in the late 18th century, marvels at the land of the Seminoles. I can venture to assert that no part of the globe so abounds of creatures fit for the food of man. The Seminoles seem to be free from want or desires. No cruel enemy to dread, nothing to give them disquietude. All of that is about to change. 1813. Encroaching white settlement drives the red stick faction of the Creeks to war. The next year, General Andrew Jackson crushes the red sticks at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. Creeks surrender over two-thirds of their territory, 20 million acres, to Jackson and the United States. As a result of the Horseshoe uh, Bend battle, many of those people that, that were left uh, moved to Florida and became a part of what we now know as the Seminole Nation. Among those on the run is a 10-year-old boy who will become a leader of Seminole resistance against the United States. His white father has named him Billy Powell. To his brothers and his enemies, he will be known as Osceola. They came as refugees after a war, and they came with what they could carry, and they came with shreds of their lives to try to find some peaceful place where they could put those lives back together and they thought that that place would be Florida. Another group of people also seek sanctuary among the Seminoles. Blacks fleeing the horrors of slavery in the United States. In Spanish Florida, the runaway slaves join other blacks working and living with the Indians. It became quite a thing to flee into Florida by, by the hundreds. And uh, it was quite productive. They could raise crops right next to the Indians. They married Indians. They became a part of the, of the frontier. Uh, they raised their families. They raised their grandchildren. And they died right here uh, in Florida. The blacks and Seminoles discover they have much in common. Many African traditions, including social structures and religious beliefs, are very similar to those of the Indians. But nothing strengthens their bond more than a common enemy, the white Americans. Stinging from the memory of the lash, the blacks warn the Seminoles never to trust the United States government. Once you've gained your freedom, you know, for the most part, once you've had that taste of freedom, they probably made up their mind that, hey, you know, I'm, they may come for me someday, but I'll never accept going back into that way of life ever again. Southern slaveholders are angry that blacks are escaping to Spanish Florida. What especially galls them is the existence of a small fort 60 miles from Georgia on the Apalachicola River. Known as the Negro Fort, it is manned by runaway slaves. 
This infuriates General Andrew Jackson. If the fort harbors the Negroes of our citizens, or holds out inducements to the slaves to desert from their owner's service, this fort must be destroyed. Acting on his own and blatantly invading the territory of another country, Jackson orders an attack. July 27, 1816. Gunboats hurl eight cannonballs at the Negro fort. None do much damage. A ninth cannonball is heated in a ship's galley and fired. The ball ignites barrels of gunpowder in the fort. 300 are killed. An American eyewitness writes his father, You cannot conceive, nor can I describe, the horrors of the scene. In an instant, hundreds of lifeless bodies were stretched upon the plain, buried in sand and rubbish, or suspended from the tops of the surrounding pines. After describing the carnage at the fort, the young man adds a postscript. First-rate land can be purchased in Florida for 50 cents per acre. What speculation! If it should ever be ours, which I think will be the case. For it is not only runaway slaves who are drawing American attention to Spanish Florida. It is the promise of more land, of a strategic territory that can give the United States control of its coasts and the Caribbean. America needs Florida, one observer notes, like a body needs a foot. Eighteen seventeen. The Secretary of War gives Andrew Jackson permission to invade the Spanish territory. Once again, the Creeks and Seminoles face the wrath of Old Hickory, the man they call Sharp Knife. What could they think but he has come for us? He's followed us, he's found us. And there's no running further. We don't have any place else to go. We either hide or fight. Jackson's troops torch Indian houses and towns and seize the city of Pensacola, all without a formal declaration of war. The Spanish government, weakened by other foreign conflicts and colonial revolts, cannot put up a fight. In 1819, Spain cedes its Florida territory to the United States. Andrew Jackson thinks he has wiped out the Seminole problem. But though their homes may be gone, the people live still praying for peace. The Seminoles did want to be left alone. They wanted to be um, what I would consider just to live as they have lived for uh, the past centuries, to be free. But an impatient America will not let them be. Florida is now part of the United States and its white citizens constantly clamor the Seminoles are in the way they must go preferably west of the Mississippi River the Seminoles do not understand why everyone cannot coexist 
but they agreed to meet with United States officials at Moultrie Creek near St. Augustine to discuss a government mandate that they be moved to a reservation in the center of the Florida Peninsula. An aging head chief named Niamathla pleads to remain in his homeland. We hope you will not send us south to a country where neither the hickory nut, the acorn, nor the persimmon grows. I am attached to the spot improved by my own labor and cannot believe my friends will drive me from it. Despite Nehemoth's plea, the Seminoles say they will move to the reservation. They find their new lands harsh and inhospitable. They were reduced to just really bare subsistence. And, and a person starving is, a, is an angry person. Uh, a person starving is a person who, who has lost hope, perhaps. Many of the Seminoles refused to stay on the reservation. Hungry and frustrated from time to time, they raid towns and plantations, further infuriating white Floridians. What's more, there is the burning issue that refuses to die slavery. Many slaveholders fear that the presence of escaped blacks in Florida will incite slave insurrections. Whites are permitted to search the reservation for runaways. Often they steal away blacks who have never even been slaves. Territorial Governor William Pope Duvall warns the Seminoles. By the treaty, you are bound to deliver all the Negroes that do not belong to the Indians. This you have not done. You are not to mind what the Negroes say. They care nothing for you, further than to make use of you to keep out of the hands of their masters. But the Seminoles will not betray their allies and friends, and the blacks are determined to stay free. This had been like a piece of heaven to them. They had built, they had harvested, they had reared their children, and uh, here were a group of people coming in saying that we own you. Eighteen thirty, their old nemesis, Andrew Jackson, is now President of the United States. Congress passes the Indian Removal Act. Forced migration westward across the Mississippi must begin now. Georgia's Indian Commissioner, Colonel James Gadsden, is sent to Payne's Landing, Florida, to formalize a new treaty. The absolute bottom line on the Treaty of Payne's Landing was, you will not stay in Florida, we will not negotiate a space, you will leave. The Payne's Landing Treaty is one of several, but all say the same thing, get out. The Seminoles who have run too many times do not want to go. This is my home. I built this home. I built this log cabin. That's my wife. That's my children. This is where I live. They didn't want to move. And who would want to move? I wouldn't want to move. I, I want to stay right there, you know, because it, it's my home. I don't care if it's an old shack, if it's my home, that's where I want to be. April 3rd, 1835. In Florida, Indian agent Wiley Thompson reads one of the treaties to a group of Seminole leaders. One of them is incensed at what he hears. The 
white people got some of our chiefs to sign a paper to give our lands to them. But our chiefs did not do as we told them to do. They done wrong. We must do right. When the agent tells me to go from my home, I hate him. Because I love my home. And I will not go from it. He is Osceola. The man who, as a boy, fled Andrew Jackson and his soldiers. Like most Seminoles, Osceola had hoped to coexist peacefully with the Americans in Florida. But Thompson's message of removal leaves him bewildered and enraged. I believe that this is the moment when everything changed in Osceola's mind. This is the moment when Osceola said to himself, Thompson will pay, and they'll see. They'll see just exactly what it means to the Indians to be pushed one more time. Although some of the chiefs agreed to emigrate west of the Mississippi to Indian territory, what is now Oklahoma, Osceola becomes a leader of the resistance. The black Seminoles, fearful of returning to slavery, side with him. Osceola knows that only drastic action will show Seminole resistance is real. He helps plan a series of actions that will prove they mean business. Thursday, October 26, 1835. Charlie Amatla, a Seminole leader, is riding back to his camp with money the government has given him to emigrate. Osceola shoots Charlie Amatla dead. He leaves the body on the trail, the money strewn around the corpse. It is a message. This is what happens to those who betray their people and homeland. What a lot of people don't realize is Charlie and Martha and Osceola were friends. They were close. But we've got to understand that sometimes in the case of one survival and, and the survival of the overall society of people, that there has to be decisions made. Friendship will not stand in the way of Osceola's fierce determination. And he will exact punishment on the Indian agent who has so arrogantly insisted that the Seminoles vanish west. December 28, 1835, two months after Charlie Amatla's death. Wiley Thompson and a friend, Lieutenant Constantine Smith, have finished dinner and are walking just outside the walls of Fort King. Both men are killed. Smith has two bullets in his body. Wiley Thompson, 14. Osceola has his revenge. I think they just took all they could take. They, they went to the uh, limit of human endurance as leaders to, to protect what they had. And they were simply willing to fight. But the fact is, we're going to fight to the end. Evening, December 27th, 1835. Central Florida. Major Francis Dade and two companies of soldiers are resting. They have been on the move for four days, a relief column headed for Fort King. So far, the trip has been uneventful. Then the morning of the 28th of December, there was a drizzle of rain falling. The temperature was some 48 degrees, quite chilly. Major Dade called out to the men and told them that I can't tell you to put your weapons on the supply wagon as it would be unmilitary. But you can carry them under your coats to keep your powder dry. 
because of this drizzle of rain. 8 a.m., cold and wet. The men march along the road between a lake and the Wahoo Swamp. Major Dade assures them they are safe. We have now got through the danger, he says. Keep up good heart, and when we get to Fort King, I'll give you three days off for Christmas. And in the next moment, quite literally, out to the north and out to the west, all alongside this column of men, what looked to them like a thousand Seminole Indians stepped out from behind the pine trees, rose up from the palmetto, and at point-blank range they fired into the faces of the command strung down this road. Probably close to half the command, some 100 men, uh, fell in their tracks, either dead or wounded. Captain George Washington Gardner tries to bring order to chaos. He stood in the road and swung his sword in the air, and even the Indians later recalled having seen him and heard him, and he shouted up and down this column, God damn, God damn. And I think it, it sums up very well in a couple of words, the absolute terror, frustration, but determination of this command. Several hours after the battle began, all but one of Dade's men are dead. That night, in the Wahoo Swamp, the Seminoles celebrate their victory. Osceola rides into camp and presents a medicine man with the scalp of Wiley Thompson, who he has killed that very afternoon. The Dade battle and Thompson's murder have been carefully coordinated. Osceola gives the whites a warning. You have guns, and so do we. You have powder, and so do we. You have men, and so have we. Your men will fight, and so will ours, until the last drop of blood has moistened the dust of his hunting grounds. Osceola continues his attacks, and fellow war leader Wildcat strikes in eastern Florida. The United States commits 5,000 men to the war. They are charged with tracking down some 1,500 warriors. It was either go to Oklahoma or die. So what is a person to do? You know, when your home is threatened, you fight. The finest generals of the U.S. command step into the fray including the great Winfield Scott, old Fuss and Feathers, hero of 1812 and the Black Hawk War. He arrives with a full military brass band and a thorough knowledge of European military strategies. They will do him little good in Florida. It was actually one of the first forms of true jungle guerrilla warfare that the military ever really experienced. And it became a very difficult task to try to remove these people from their homelands. The military strides in only to find itself bogged down in mud and antiquated tactics. The blue of their uniforms, the noise they make, 
the men are walking targets. It was so bad that men fought the terrain almost as much as they fought the Indians. The climate, the fact that it was either abysmally hot or abysmally cold, that when you were cold you were also wet and when you were hot you were also wet. Uh, the fact that they were never quite walking on land but they weren't quite walking in water made this a really difficult place to be. Three generals, including Winfield Scott, go down in defeat. December 1836, General Thomas S. Jessup takes command of 8,000 soldiers and volunteers. His orders, beat the Seminoles with whatever it takes and ship whoever is still alive out to Indian territory. After a year of little success, Jessup decides that the only way to defeat the Seminoles is to lure them in under a white flag of truce. Tricked into believing the army wants to talk peace, hundreds of war-weary Seminoles are captured and sent west. Another violation, another lie, another way of, of protecting our land uh, in a less than noble way. But to be taken over under a flag of truce was unthinkable. The course that Jessup finally decided to take was without doubt uh, an indication of his own personal desperation and the desperation of the United States to do something, to bring this conflict to a close, to settle this seminal question. Two years of war and life on the run are taking their toll on the Seminoles. An ailing Osceola and his comrade Wildcat hope to negotiate a settlement with Jessup. But they too are duped by the false white flag. Surrounded by hundreds of soldiers, Osceola, who had stood as a fiery symbol of Seminole defiance, is now a prisoner of war. He is paraded through the streets of St. Augustine and imprisoned at Fort Marion. December, 1837. As hundreds of disheartened Seminoles are captured and dispatched west, the government decides to ship Osceola North to a harbor fort in Charleston, South Carolina. Osceola becomes a tourist attraction as sightseers crowd to gawk at him. He is weak and weary, ill with malaria, and Quincy, an infected, inflamed, sore throat. George Catlin, the artist who chronicled so much of what we know about 19th century Native American life, arrives to paint his portrait. He is a most extraordinary man, Catlin writes. And one entitled to a better fate, he is grieving with a broken spirit and ready to die, cursing the white man, no doubt, to the end of his breath. January 30th, 1838. Unable to talk, the 33-year-old Osceola signals his wives to bring him his full war dress. He paints his face, knowing that sickness is going to end his life. He shakes hands with everyone in the room, including physician Frederick Wheaton. He made a signal for them to lower him down upon his bed. He then slowly drew from his war belt his scalping knife, which he firmly grasped in his right hand, and in a moment smiled away his last breath without a struggle or a groan. 
He was just the epitome of, of life for the Seminole. Very proud people, uh, people who were tied to the land and for very spiritual reasons. A group of people who loved their families and would do anything to protect and defend their family and their home. Although Osceola has been the emblem of their fight to stay in Florida, his dying does not end the struggle. The Seminoles, both natives and blacks, vow to fight on. Wildcat, the Seminole leader who had been captured with Osceola, has succeeded in a daring escape from the Fort Marion prison. These people believed that they were going to die anyway, and so they fasted and got to the point where they were pretty small and was able to scale the wall and, and to uh, loosen the bars, take them out. The opening was uh, only seven to eight inches wide with two bars. One night, uh, these Seminoles were able to scale the wall, and go out that opening, and uh, drop 24 feet down on the outside to a moat. Wildcat flees south and reunites with Seminole warriors near Lake Okeechobee. Christmas Day, 1837. A future American president, Colonel Zachary Taylor, pursues the Seminoles into their Okeechobee sanctuary. With him are 800 regular soldiers and 200 Missouri volunteers. At the first volley from the Seminoles, the volunteers flee. But Taylor's regulars stay in line. The Battle of Okeechobee is the largest of the war, the last time the warriors and soldiers will meet in such numbers. The Seminoles fight bravely, but are pushed further south into the murky swamps of the Everglades. Nothing they do seems to stop the relentless demands of the whites to get out or die. Members of Congress protest the expense and loss of life, but the skirmishes grind on, year after year, a frustrating war of attrition. Many Seminoles cling to the hope that the United States will finally relent and let them hold on to some small plot of land. They are hungry and sick, but they will not give in. You couldn't keep a child who was under three years old because they had to eat. Mother's milk failed because mothers didn't have enough food or drink and they cried and they can be very loud when they cry. So sometimes in order for the survival of all the other people and children, they had to, you know, snuff the children, snuff the child that was crying. They didn't intend to, but if there was somebody real close by, uh, they would put their hands over the mouth. And you can't really do that without suffocating the child. So that sometimes it was accidental, and sometimes they had to do it on purpose. One by one, many of the Seminoles decide there is no alternative to emigration. Some of the old people decided that they would not move to the new territory, that they would die on the Florida land, and they stayed behind. But some of them who had still full lives ahead of them, 
wanted to see the welfare of their children and of their band and of their people to still replenish and start over again, I guess you could say, they decided to, to, to move and to go to Indian Territory. October 1841. Even the great warrior Wildcat has been captured. He and his people prepare to sail for New Orleans and the trek to Indian Territory. I am looking at the last pine trees on my land. It was my home. I love it. And to leave it now is like burying my wife and child. I have thrown away my rifle and taken the hand of the white man. And now say to him, take care of me. It was a time where once that they knew they were loaded up on the barges of the ships, that they knew they would never see that land that their ancestors had lived and abided on for hundreds of years. But to know that you're leaving and you're never going to return, that's almost like saying that uh, being that their home was as a mother to them, that would like uh, you having to go away and you're saying goodbye to your mother and you know you would never see her again after this last time that you laid eyes on her. You would never see her again. Those are the type of feelings that those people that were leaving Florida perhaps could have felt. August 14th, 1842. It has been more than six and a half years since the death of Wiley Thompson and the killings at the Dade Battle. Deciding that further fighting is senseless, General William Jenkins Worth declares the war at an end. The war didn't end because there was any clear victory. The war didn't end if it did really end because one side capitulated. The war ended because the United States ultimately got sick and tired of fighting it. And because public clamor was such and congressional opinion was such that the United States government no longer wished to appropriate funds for the prosecution of what appeared to be a losing war, a war which simply could not be won. And so in 1842, it was decided by the United States government unilaterally that the war would be declared at a close. More than 2,000 American soldiers have died and untold hundreds of Seminoles. 3,000 have been removed to Indian territory. To achieve this, Washington has spent $40 million, the equivalent of more than $7 billion today. But in spite of all the money and all the bloodshed, the government never truly defeats the Seminoles. At war's end, 300 still remain in Florida. Having successfully resisted for so long, they are allowed to stay. To these survivors, the United States has given in. There was a certain faction, Seminoles, 
that can actually officially say that they did not come to the point where they said, we surrender, we give up. The ones who would never officially surrender or sign a peace treaty with the government in the time of conflict with the United States. They became the ones who would be known as the unconquered. Today, almost 3,000 descendants of the unconquered Seminoles still live in Florida. Another 11,000 are in Oklahoma, the old Indian Territory. Now, along the Tamiami Trail, the Florida Seminoles lure tourists. The alligator that he has there would weigh a little over 200 pounds. And the war they wage is economic. Bingo halls have helped revive an economy that was dependent on cattle and citrus. I-16. Gambling brings in the bulk of the tribe's $30 million annual revenue. Florida State University's football team, the Seminoles, were the 1993 NCAA national champions. Every fall Saturday, a new Osceola rides. But when the games are over and the sightseers back home, this remains. In the face of overwhelming military might, the Seminole tribe never died. They looked power in the face and didn't flinch. They fought back. I believe that their people and their descendants ought to be looked on in history as a people of survival. A people that, under any given circumstances, adapted and continued to hold on and to live on and to cherish life.